happy Arab American Heritage Month, everyone. As some of you might know, this year mar marked the official designation of April as Arab American Heritage Month, and Arab Googlers have been celebrating with global events hosted throughout the month, including this collaboration with TalkSat, which we're so excited to bring you today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Cassie Shami, and I am the Culture and Inclusion Lead of Arab Googlers. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Mohammed Al Shahid, who is a curator and architectural historian focusing on modernism in Egypt and the Arab world. He is a Paul Mellon Visiting Scholar Fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies at the Smithsonian Washington, D.C., and a 2023 Fellow at the Columbia University Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Paris. We will be having a Q&A later on, so if our audience wants to ask Mohammed a question, please use the YouTube chat to post your questions throughout the event. Without further ado, welcome Mohammed Al Shahid. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Casey. Um, very happy to be speaking with you through Google Talks and to be having access to, to this platform. Um, and I hope I don't disappoint speaking about Egyptian modernity and some of my work um, in, the, in the next 35 minutes or so. I know you won't, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So um, I'll get started right away. Um, and first, let me maybe restress the title that I chose for today because these really are the keywords um, through which that I will um, speak about some of my projects and the concerns and questions that have been kept me busy, uh, that have kept me busy for the last uh, decade and a half or so, um, uh, working on the question of modernism in the Arab region, specifically Egypt, and then that taking me into wider questions of modernism and modernity in the global south. So time, space, and objects of Egyptian modernity. Um, these words will sort of guide uh, the rest of the talk. And I guess um, aided here with um, a few Mexican murals, uh, which is Mexico is where I live. Um, I have sort of shifted to the next phase of my life um, as exploring Mexico and Latin America uh, in a comparative way with um, the Middle East. And actually this comparative uh, approach uh, and view really presents uh, interesting sometimes jarring uh, truths. Um, well, we don't need to be told too much to say to say that, you know, it's a pretty rough moment in human history. Um, at least it seems like um, there's quite a lot of shock, um, and a, lot of, a lot is growing on. And as Naomi Klein uh, says um, in her shock doctrine, um, you know, this disorientation that comes from, from a sort of a shock to the system uh, comes from losing one's narrative. And so perhaps history uh, or an idea of re recuperating, reconstructing a history or a narrative or having a sense of a timeline even can be then useful uh, mechanisms that we as individuals, but also society, uh, societies, designers, uh, communities within uh, society uh, come together to sort of formulate um, a sense of who we are based on what has happened in the past, but also looking at our present. So these ideas generated this project that, um, I did in 2022, uh, it, it is a timeline.com, it's, it's a website, uh, which is currently kind of, um, you know, I initiated it and I'll talk more about the life of the project itself uh, in a moment. But what the idea was is um, rather than revert to the text lines and histories that already exist in order to sort of resist the sense of shock that one feels, whether because of the politics um, or destruction that's happening in various places that makes the, the scripting of history more difficult, or even on the individual level where, you know, personal relationships are quite strained under such uh, conditions. Um, so in order to recuperate, the idea of a timeline seemed very useful, especially when I was working on an exhibition um, called Cairo Modern for the Center for Architecture in New York. Uh, and there it seemed necessary that what I take for granted, the history of modern Egypt uh, and its architecture of the 20th century, uh, may be completely unfamiliar to an audience uh, in Manhattan. So in order to make it kind of directly visible and visual, um, a timeline kind of was necessitated uh, uh, to be um, on one of the walls, essentially. And the idea was to look at benchmarks within um, the history of modern design in Egypt that I've identified through my study uh, in relationship to other benchmarks and references that are happening in, in other places in the world, especially places and, uh, and benchmarks that are, let's say, internationally famous that everybody knows, um, more or less. Um, and uh, I added later on with the current form of the, of the website, a kind of a comparative lens by wanting to specifically look at the Middle East and Latin America. So actually what you're looking at here um, from 1900 to the present 
it's just a small sample of uh, what the project, what the website um, can provide in a way, um, not providing fixed narratives as maybe we were uh, accustomed in the past, uh, but to provide sort of a tool that then allows for a selection of, like I said, um, individuals, buildings, publications, exhibitions, um, and then events uh, as well that frame these uh, or, or sort of happen around uh, these benchmarks in the history of design um, and to see them together. So um, maybe I'll also tell you that so far it's organized um, with these categories, the person building and so on. So for example, if we zoom in to, um, if we zoom into the idea of sort of the event, um, then you can also zoom in the timeline so that you can expand it and um, and see uh, a closer view uh, rather than this kind of collapsed view that you saw in the beginning. And um, yeah, if we scroll down, so these are only events uh, that are highlighted on the, um, the timeline so far. And um, yeah, so they range everything from the discovery of Tutankhamun, you know, events in Egyptian history uh, make a lot more sense, I suppose, when they're put in context. Um, so the bread rise of 1977, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra in Egypt two years later as part of the political sort of momentum that was built um, around the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, um, and sort of a, a confirmation of Egypt's shift towards uh, the U.S. Um, so events like that, when they're placed together on a timeline in relation to architecture and other design events, um, you know, become much more kind of um, interesting, I think, for debate. So one event I included here is this image, uh, the Blue Marble, which was in 1972. Um, and what I think is really interesting about it is that in 1972, perhaps for the first time, we're able to look at um, the Earth as an object. Um, and what that means is um, it's an object that has also um, a background um, which in many ways also raises questions about self and other. And Alan Watts, uh, you know, says a lot um, of things about how we view the world in the way we view ourselves. So, you know, are you the type of person who sees um, self and other, or do you see the object versus the background, um, or are you constantly aware of both? Um, and I think, <clears throat> you know, this question of who is looking once we have an object, and a background, the question of who is looking, you know, is it uh, the persecuted uh, activist? Is it the, the engineer, the aspiring architect? Is it the philosopher? Um, and so maybe <clears throat> to affirm here, uh, my own position has been one of the observer. And I think it's important here also to think about what that means. And one possible way to look at the reading of what that is, um, maybe is what, um, again, Alan Watts here suggests, which is, um, that in reality, you cannot really separate the observer from the observed, um, I think. And I, I would actually, um, um, I guess I would say that I adopt that view. And it raises again the question of who is looking. So the narratives that we construct, the histories, will always be composed of fragments um, that we choose. And that will have to do with who is looking and what we're looking at. So this is kind of more a framing of how I approach um, this question of um, modernity or modernism or modern design in, in general, but um, how I've approached it in the context of, um, of Egypt. So in order to clarify maybe my point, I'm actually just going to revert to um, Alan Watts himself. I'm not saying that you imagine the world, each one of you out of your own private whimsy, imagines the kind of world that there is. What I'm saying is this, that the construction of the nervous system selects a world. You see, your senses are selective. There are certain vibrations which they receive and others that they don't. Then on top of your senses comes your noticing what your senses tell, because you don't notice all. And that, again, is another act of selection. And then on top of that is how you interpret what you notice, what patterns of sense you fit it into, what patterns of reason, what patterns of uh, what you call good judgment. And that's still another level of selection. 
so constantly, the world that we are aware of is a selection of our mind. And so with this foreground um, and this idea of selection, which maybe others would call curating, um, I would prefer to actually use the word selection. Um, you know, let's look at then the keywords maybe that are used for today's title. So time, um, uh, one way to look at it is duration. Um, you know, these are obviously things that have uh, kept humans occupied for the entire hum history of humanity. What is time um, and what is space? Uh, but one way to think of it is, is duration. So uh, this is very evident in the example of buildings because they get built at some point and most often uh, they disappear, they get demolished or erased at another point. So one way to, then to think of time uh, when thinking about uh, the history of modernity in a place like Egypt or elsewhere, it could be the duration of the object of study, let's say architecture, or the duration of someone's lifetime. So um, architect, say, Karim, who is the main architect I have uh, really um, kept myself occupied with since my studies, um, really as a master's student uh, at MIT with the undergrad program for Islamic art and architecture. So this is 2005, 2007. Um, yeah, he's been someone that um, I found to be um, key in understanding the history of modernity in Egypt uh, and what it could have been, not just what it was. Um, and, you know, again, um, his own lifespan, 94 years uh, from 1911 to 2005, um, you know, is another kind of idea of thinking, a way of thinking about time. Seven years uh, out of that time span is what he spent uh, under house arrest in his own villa, which you see parts of here. Um, and that was built in 1948. Um, or 18 years, the the lifespan of the magazine he founded in 1939, Alamara Magazine, which um, you know, as to the best of my knowledge, um, so far it's the first Arabic language magazine focused on contemporary um, at the time, um, so design uh, of architecture, um, focusing on Egypt, but uh, also it had distribution regionally and um, occasionally showed. Uh, projects happening elsewhere as well. So uh, so that's another way to think about it. Uh, um, 57 years, perhaps, the span of this building. So again, what I showed uh, earlier with this uh, villa in Alexandria, um, the time uh, time as sort of the lifespan of, of a building. And of course, um, and this is, by the way, my book, uh, this picture is directly from my book, um, Cairo Since 1900, uh, An Architectural Guide, which um, I'll touch on in a bit. Uh, but, you know, so to arrange these bits and pieces um, along the timeline, um, as opposed to a narrative, so this is before narrative, um, I think can become a very useful exercise. You know, I, you know, before doing this um, timeline for the exhibit in New York, I didn't necessarily realize that, um, you know, such a, an important moment, let's say, in the history of uh, design theory is this essay by Adolf Loos, which um, uh, was published in um, 1908, or was, uh, in fact, uh, presented in 1908. Um, you know, I didn't realize, for example, before this, that that was also the same year that um, Cairo had um, uh, a fine arts uh, school, uh, including architecture, uh, being established in 1908. Um, that's also the year of the Ford Model T. That's also the year of the Young Turk Revolution. Um, and it's also the year that the Hejaz Railway opened. So these might seem like random and disparate uh, bits and pieces of information, but for my position, and this is where we go back to this idea of self, background, and other, and uh, kind of the themes that I was trying to present earlier on, or leave open at least, um, is I am constantly aware of my position as writer, histor historian, but also as private citizen, as someone who's experiencing history um, myself. Um, so these themes that have then sort of curated or chose or selected, um, kind of mimicking this natural process that Alan Watts uh, spoke about in which the body and the mind uh, operates, selecting uh, what to pay attention to um, and whatnot, starts to paint a picture. Um, and as long as that picture is understood as one of many potential pictures, um, you know, that then begins, I think, to deliver a very different idea of history and how it can be discussed and presented, especially when we're speaking about a region like the Middle East. Uh, in which the disciplines that we use to narrate history, art history, and so on, were disciplines that were created elsewhere, um, not based on the history in this place. So in order to fit the history within those disciplines, a lot gets lost. And along the way, there are, you know, civil strife, wars, and so on, uh, that, uh, you know, 
not only do they have human victims, but also archives and actual buildings um, and things that would have been part of, um, of design history. So what I'm trying to do here is, um, um, is to kind of recuperate other ways maybe of thinking about um, how can we think about this without waiting. You know, it takes years for some of these books that we need to write that have been unwritten, that have not been written. It, they take years if the material is available um, right now. Um, and in that time, a lot can get lost. And what's really important to remember is that there are narratives that exist out there. Um, and there are historians and histories that are written um, that need to be responded to, engaged with, um, uh, criticized, uh, and complicated. Um, so it's a complicated landscape, really, what I'm trying to describe here, which probably um, explains the sense of shock that a lot, especially um, younger generations in the Middle East feel in terms of their relationship to history, especially recent history, um, which you know, they have very little um, engagement with um, because so much of it is being lost and made invisible. So space, um, kind of like time, if we thought of it as duration, um, I think space um, can be useful to think about both as um, what's within a container, a physical container that then is constructed or the space between objects and, and buildings as containers. Um, and so um, for me, a figure like Sekerim, which I mentioned earlier, has been the focus because he does fulfill a lot of, um, he checks a lot of boxes. He, he's a very useful position from which to tell a story about um, time actually place and objects um, in modern Egypt. Um, so I'll quickly show why that is. So he's an architect who has actually um, come up with quite daring designs, many of which were not built. Um, this is a, a regional uh, culture palace for um, a city called uh, Asyut in the south of Egypt that was proposed in 1961 but was not built. Um, this is a hotel complex um, from 1955. Um, um, but he also, so in addition to these unbuilt kind of daring projects, he also, again, is important because of the fact that he published this magazine that I mentioned, 39 to 1957, uh, very key. He also published polemics to engage with the public to actually raise questions about the future and fate of the city that he lives in, which is um, Cairo for most of his life. Um, and in addition to that, he also published uh, theory. Um, so not only... Uh, theoretical building designs, but also ideas manifested through these theoretical building designs as they're composed together in a book. So a really um, um, complex and multi-layered um, person. Um, he also works with scales. So this is one of his unrealized kind of ideas that could be multiplied to create um, from the building unit to a neighborhood unit and then collectively into a city uh, unit. So he's thinking about multiple scales. There's almost kind of a fractal uh, quality to this particular design. Um, and some of these designs on a larger scale were in fact manifested, <clears throat> such as this project that has now become part of uh, like a neighborhood, uh, Nasser City, part of a greater Cairo, but at the time it was envisioned by him or is seen by him as um, an entirely new city, kind of like what Brasilia was for, uh, for Brazil. And so thinking about space is not only in terms of history, but also in terms of my present as a practitioner or um, someone who's engaged with this history and how to bring it into another kind of space. So for example, here in this case, um, in an installation in Somerset House, um, which is in London, which once upon a time was part of the British Navy that in 1882 bombarded Alexandria um, and that was the beginning of formal British colonization. So here I am as an Egyptian a hundred some years later <clears throat> invited to do an installation on Egyptian modernity, or that's the concept that I came up with for the installation, but in that building. So space, um, if we pause for a minute, can really have multiple and um, uh, yeah, quite complex relations to, to, to unpack and think about here, you know, this installation in this building in this time. Um, but yeah, so, um, and to think about time and space again, the logo of the magazine was part of um, the, uh, this particular installation. Uh, the name of the installation was Modernist Indignation, and it was at the two 2018 um, London Design Biennial, and it took the overall uh, medal. Um, and on the floor was inscribed the logo of the magazine so that throughout the duration of the, uh, of the biennial, visitors um, actually, by moving through the space, they erase 
uh, the logo. I mean, so so this idea of erased history over time without investigation and without study is kind of manifested in a microcosm uh, of the room in which this history is being presented. Um, and just to give you another idea of uh, other sort of exercises of displaying this kind of information about um, a particular architect, his ideas about space, um, and the actual manifestations of those ideas. Um, in another place, here in this case, uh, at the Center for Architecture um, in New York City, um, where there was an opportunity also to tease out um, stories that are about the specific context in which uh, the exhibit or the installation is taking place. So because the exhibit was in New York, um, it made a lot of sense to try to unpack the story of the unbuilt um, Egyptian pavilion at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. Um, so again, dealing uh, kind of in a proactive way uh, in thinking about the past, but how it is presented also um, in, in those particular spaces today um, that are available for exhibition, for example, for storytelling. Um, another um, medium, I suppose, for storytelling or for um, narrating uh, or collecting fragments in order to, to uh, place it along the timeline to then complicate our ideas of uh, the relation between people, things, and objects, and spaces, and all of that, um, would be some of the uh, objects that are collected as part of um, um, a short-term, two-year project, um, experimental project that was at the British Museum um, from 2018, uh, 16 to 18. Um, I'll just run through the objects to kind of maybe get you interested um, about the kinds of questions they raise. Um, so, for example, um, this is uh, the first one was a uh, 1920s, I, uh, I think, is the best guess that we have, um, typewriter. Um, that was uh, actually seen as published, uh, not published, um, it was published at the time as um, a product that was made specifically for the Egyptian state to run its operations. So that alone can open a whole um, kind of chapter of investigation and, and um, um, and a lot of untold histories. Um, and then here we have these kind of symbolic objects. Uh, to the right is uh, one that has uh, the presidential in Sydney of the 1970s. And then to the left is the royal in Sydney before the 1952 uh, overthrow of the, of the monarchy. So sort of the, the changing and transformations um, of symbols in public space, um, symbols of the nation, all of that. So these are all stories that can be told through objects, of course. Um, there are some uh, objects of furniture uh, and music. Um, and, and then some of my favorites are really everyday objects that tell us about consumption. Um, because when we think about the 20th century um, and a lot of the sort of unwritten histories in terms of social life, uh, you know, consumption is a really useful lens. Um, what did people consume? What did it look like? Um, you know, it can start to open a, a wide set of questions uh, that I think my idea here is if we think about that Earth um, photo earlier, it's not all um, equally clear. Some parts of that planet, if we think of it as, as, a, as a pixelated photo, will be much more pixelated than others in terms of the richness of information and detail that we have um, for those parts of the planet, the map, um, than others. So I think these types of exercises can really um, help us um, um, yeah, add richness uh, so that those pixels are, are a little bit less um, and the, along with the actual collecting, you know, there were um, efforts to also exhibit and display in spaces in Cairo and in London um, in order to showcase the project, of course, and the object and the history that they can potentially tell, but also engage publics with, um, with, with, yeah, with this kind of work. Um, and I think it's really important for me to say that, you know, what I have been working on in the last 10 day, uh, 10, uh, 10 years uh, may have focused on a particular time frame within um, Egyptian history in the mid 20th century, for example, but never in my mind did the past, present and future be uh, were separated. So uh, my interest in design and contemporary design culture and what's happening now is kind of this natural blend uh, between my research uh, on the past um, and then sort of thinking about what people are doing now and with the, uh, the design landscape. What, what are the objects of today? Um, those are sort of not disconnected um, questions. Um, and yeah, so along with that, there are, there's been, just wanted to show this publication that was done with this particular exhibit, which sort of brings this interest in, um, yeah, in visual, urban visual culture and material culture into, um, into the present. <clears throat> okay, so sort of toward the close here, 
Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I guess, a question that I was asked when I showed uh, a lot of these objects um, that were collected for the Modern Egypt project when they were shown in Cairo. Um, two really interesting questions uh, would uh, arise from the public that visited. One was, what makes this particular object Egyptian? Um, and what makes it modern. Um, so these were, uh, yeah, so I, I think the idea of Egyptian, obviously like any other um, identity can get really uh, <clears throat> complicated to discuss, um, especially, you know, uh, once in a while in the media, there'll be a story. Um, there is one right now, of course, about a, a Netflix show that I won't mention too much more about. But um, yeah, it, it gets uh, kind of pushy, uh, not pushy, people get pushy when, when this topic is, um, is raised. So maybe I should look at an object here from the collection that I think maybe presents the question in a different way. You know, what is English? So this poster was made for school, um, Egyptian schools, uh, primary schools, um, presumably 1930s. Um, so the height really of British colonialism in Egypt. And so here, um, Egyptian school kids are being educated about, you know, what are the English? That's the title of, um, of the poster. And it shows, you know, sporty, family oriented, the police crosses, you know, helps children cross the street, industrious um, and, and so on. So clearly, obviously in the historical context, this is a sort of propaganda. Um, but I think always these kinds of identities um, having to do with the nation state and of course empire as well, which are sort of two, two sides of the same coin, um, uh, you know, will always be these uh, constructed identities that are difficult to really can be convincing once you break them apart. So equally, what is Egyptian really is, is not really a question that has a, um, a clear answer, especially when we come to, or it maybe becomes very clear when we look at the, the contemporary moment. And even a Google search doesn't necessarily satisfy that particular question because it is not easy. Uh, but one object uh, that I thought would help maybe uh, tackle this, one object from the collection, um, is the cigarette box, which, um, in fact, only makes sense in the context of, let's say, 1920s or 30s Cairo. Um, however, it is composed of parts that come from very different places. So the woodwork itself is English, um, and then the, de the decoration is made in Egypt. Um, the inlays, and then the music box, because when you open it, it plays music, is Swiss. Um, so somehow, yeah, it, it, it has, it, you know, it sources elements from multiple parts and involves different hands, but the complete object only kind of made sense in that time and place, at that intersection of time and place. It could be at other intersections of time and place, perhaps in Istanbul or in Damascus, um, but it is sort of identifying where these objects uh, appear I think that's what really helps us understand the time and place in which they are found rather than constructed um, identities uh, that sort of decide today this is what's Egyptian or tomorrow that it changes. Um, I think these objects uh, force us uh, as material evidence to, to just accept things that might be uncomfortable that yes, maybe a Swiss English Egyptian uh, object is what it means to have an Egyptian object in the 1920s in a global economy, uh, in a particular kind of culture, in a particular kind of, uh, yeah, a political setting. And so finally, what's modernity? Um, I guess after this little bit of a, a tour of ideas, mostly of how I'm, uh, I'm trying to, uh, as I'm flipping the page, moving forward to Latin America as a fo main focus of my interest and study. And again, this kind of comparative lens with where I come from, with the Middle East, I think it's nice to reflect, for me at least, <laughs> productive for me, to reflect on what are these ideas that I'm coming out of, uh, of, of this experience of looking at this material uh, with. So modernity becomes a very obvious question to ask. When one way to think of it is, um, you know, without overloading it with existing definitions, some of which, again, rise one day and are taken down the next, is to think of it as change. Um, but then the question is, what kind of change? How fast is the change? Um, and again, this is why I think places like Mexico or Latin America, in comparison to our region like the Middle East, become very useful. So this is an image from um, an exhibition that's taking place right now in Mexico City, which is looking at uh, the practice of a particular architecture op uh, office, uh, Sordo Modaleno. Um, so it's a three-generation office, um, but the exhibit itself is taking place in, um, um, in I think it's a 16th century palace, um, 
uh, in downtown uh, Mexico City. And so I think this idea of how do we revisit our own history, you know, this type of thing hasn't yet been seen uh, in other places where it could, uh, where the past and present are not seen in sort of contradiction to one another, where they can actually coexist, where a conversation about the present is inherently one about the past and inherently one about the future. I think um, it exercises like this. Um, this is a massive screen which shows projects from this 20th century um, uh, office, um, beautiful, stunning images that are completely submersive when you're standing within it, but you are, when you zoom out at the big picture where you're actually standing, it's, an, it's a 16th, 17th century um, courtyard. So in a way, kind of that exercise of standing in that space, you know, if you only looked really close, uh, you would only see the modernist uh, representation of the modernist, let's say, history. But, you know, zooming out, shifting the, the, uh, the perspective and, and also being aware of one's positionality is really what I'm trying to argue for here. Um, and maybe one example of this is um, going back to al Amara magazine and Sayyid Karim, um, you know, there is kind of a pressure to constantly read modernity with a very heavy narrative that it's something that is owned by a certain group of people that is then exported and spread through different mechanisms. Um, and sometimes these narratives become so forceful that they're misplaced. Uh, but, you know, uh, Ramara and Saeed Karim, you know, when he decided to dedicate an entire issue to another country, it wasn't the United States, it wasn't the United Kingdom, and it wasn't Paris or Rome, it was Brazil. So this issue in 1952, the only issue by the, of the magazine that was entirely dedicated to another country was all about what was happening between 1950 and 1952 in Brazil. Um, and so being aware of this history and also of my positionality when the opportunity came to go to Brazil and to present about um, uh, about Zay Karim um, and, and his work, you know, then, then that kind of made sense. Um, so in a way, I'm trying to continue uh, a certain, not, let's not call it a legacy, but place myself vis-a-vis, -vis, not only write about this history, but place myself vis-a-vis -vis the individuals about whom I'm uh, investigating and, and, and building a narrative. Um, and so maybe I'll just use the last mm, two minutes or so to bring us up to the present. So a timeline.com, um, again, is 1900 to the present. It's meant to be. Right now it has a few hundred um, entries. Uh, my idea is that it should reach to about a thousand, both in English and in Spanish. Um, and again, with the kind of variety that I've showed, but what I, that I mentioned earlier on, but um, the idea is that it does come to the present um, because um, I think it's really difficult to engage with our history or with our present predicament situation as a society and as individuals when we divorce past, present, and future from each other. So even the graphic of how the website is presented with kind of this sinuous line, um, it is still a linear direction, but it's, um, it's also kind of trying to move away from our visual conceptualization of history as sort of this directed kind of arrow. Um, so the website does come to the present, but these projects should be looked at together. So an architect practice in today, uh, like the one you just saw on screen, um, and Sayyid Karim in the Egyptian context should be understood uh, in relation to another historically, geographically, and, in, you know, and, and, and through all of these different lenses that can help us understand uh, the individuals and their work. Um, and again, broaden the lens, to, like you can see now, to include Latin American architects, um, uh, or other regions that may be useful for someone else. So for me, this has been kind of a, a useful, again, construction of fragments um, in a very self-aware way of my position, but also uh, that this is one of many possible ways uh, to read past, present, and future without relying too much on expired narratives that I think um, are quite forcefully fed to us as societies and individuals um, and seem to have... Um, yeah, lost their efficacy uh, at this point in time. And to close, at the end of the day, I hope, as I kind of started in the beginning in a, on a personal note, that this somehow should all be, you know, uh, our engagement with the world and what we project into it and how we understand it. We also said a lot about ourselves. Um, and so I hope that um, it is clear that a lot of this does come from very personal beginnings and attachments and interests in architecture and ultimately the place that I um, that I come from, um, and I think that this is uh, 
pretty good way to end. So thank you all. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mohammed. We have um, some questions from the audience, if you'd be willing to answer them. Yeah, definitely. Sorry I rushed through this. I wanted to be on the 35 minute mark. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Um, the first one we have is from Thakri. So he asked, what are the top challenges that architects face in the Middle East, maybe Egypt specifically, compared to other regions like America? Um, well, um, maybe one quick way to say is that we shouldn't see those as separate uh, region situations. Um, the profession in the U.S. and the profession in each in, in the Middle East actually are much more integrated than it may appear. Uh, the Middle East has provided huge uh, new frontiers for um, American and Western offices to thrive, and that actually does then automatically create a kind of condition for the local architects that they have to deal with, which is you either work as part of these big offices or you have a really steep uh, uphill battle to make an impression or you'll have your small clients or your shift to, to graphic design or something else. So yeah, it is a challenging situation. And I would understand that challenge by actually not separating the region from, let's say what you mentioned in your question in the US, but actually looking at them together. Wonderful. I think we have time for one more. Um, and I believe it comes from Amina. So the question is, how do you envision modernism in the Arab world evolving over the next three to five years? Um, well, uh, excellent question, because in many ways, what I'm trying to argue here is that we get orient disoriented when we don't know where we've come from. And this is where uh, our sense of where we're going and where we're at to get a bit distorted and maybe anxious for some people even. Um, so I would say in order to understand what that even means, what will architecture look like in five years, whatever happens in five years will be the result of today. And whatever happens today will be the result of how we understand where we've come from. So I would say actually flip it around um, and let's spend the next five years collectively as a profession, let's say, or groups within the profession, really trying to hone in how we, who we are as individuals, as a community of designers and architects, and then how we relate to what I tried to show, kind of this intersection of time um, and space that we come from and that we're interested in, that we want to work in. I think that is the best way to really think about what comes next, as opposed to saying, here's a finished design. This is where architecture should go in the next five years. Um, so it's not a formula to follow. It's rather kind of what a, an invitation to, yeah, to, for everybody to do a little bit of maybe the exercise that I just did myself, uh, maybe for the first time actually, and did it vulnerably and publicly. So I hope more of us kind of, yeah, dig in. Why are we interested in this? I went right, right at home, you know, Alexandria, mother, um, childhood moments, great architecture. These beginnings do shape uh, or can shape, uh, you know, an entire life. And that was the case with me. This is why I'm interested in this. So I hope everybody <laughs> or more people would, uh, I would invite more to do this kind of investigation and that should shape our future. Awesome. Well, Mohammed, thank you so much for being here with us for um, closing out our Arab Heritage Month events. We appreciate your time and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much.